Buenos dias. Well, welcome all. I know you're all excited for this panel today. I'm State Senator Cristina Castro. Uh, before we begin, uh, volunteers, raise your hands. So we have two volunteers here. If you have questions for this panel or want to, you have some already burning questions you want to ask, raise your hand and the volunteers will give you a slip so that we're trying to make this, we want to make this fun and lively and get all as many of your questions answered as possible. So if you have a question, raise your hand and I'm going to turn it over to Assistant Majority Leader Lisa Hernandez. Thank you, buenos dias. Good morning. Well, it's uh, our 17th annual uh, Latino Legislative Latino Caucus Foundation uh, Conference. We're very excited. I do want to start by, I did mention it, if you were not in the earlier program, it's a real exciting time. This session was uh, incredibly successful and due to uh, very much to uh, new leadership, starting with the governor's office. So um, there, was, there was quite a bit of legislation and I could, you know, I'm going to say it. I've been working on the immigration effort for so many years, and to see 14 pieces of immigration legislation pass the session on a time like this, that's success. We stand out. So. This year, uh, we, we, we thought about it. We were very, we're very mindful on how we want to sort of uh, focus or what we want to highlight. Definitely, we're talking about census. But there's a lot that happened in Springfield that there is no doubt that we want to give you sort of a, uh, a, 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 um, a lens through what uh, is happening uh, and in the governor's sort of office where we have invited the uh, deputy governors to give you sort of the download in each of those areas and how you know the Latino communities have been uh, impacted through um, and how we are meeting and will be meeting equity access as we move forward. Um, I have to tell you, we are very fortunate uh, to have a, an addition here. Um, we are not, unfortunately, a Sol Flores couldn't join us, something popped up, um, but we are very, very fortunate to have uh, the Chief of Staff to the Governor's Office, and Capara here. Am I saying that right? Capara. Capara. I got to get it right. <laughs> I got to get it right. So we're very, very fortunate. I want to tell you a little bit about Anne. Anne presently serves as Chief of Staff to Governor J.B. Pritzer. She has served as Chief of Staff for two members of the United States House of Representatives. Her extensive experience includes managing and overseeing campaigns for the U.S. Senate in almost every state in the country. Ms. Caprera has an MA degree from George Washington University and an undergraduate degree from American University. She was able to get our new Governor Pritzer here. Uh, and I want to uh, introduce her. She has some remarks uh, per the governor's office. And please, thank you for being here. Let's give her a warm welcome. Well, thank you so much for having us this morning. Um, I bring greetings on behalf of the governor who wishes that he could be here today. But those of you who have met Governor Pritzker, um, he is all around the state at all times. We can barely keep up with him. Um, but we thank you for getting us all out of the office this morning. <laughs> um, and I know that the governor would want me to extend uh, very warm um, wishes for your holidays next week. I am looking forward to getting away from the relative calm of state government to go home to my large Italian family for Thanksgiving um, <laughs> next week. So if you, think, if you think debates here are interesting, you should come home to my house. Um, and we particularly want to thank the Illinois Legislative Latino Caucus and the Illinois Legislative Latino Caucus Foundation and your leadership here, Senator Aquino and Representative Hernandez. You are well, well represented in Springfield. Um, these were the folks that worked with us hand in glove for the last several months to get all of the work done and the stuff that we are going to talk about today, so thank you. Um, 
This is actually the first time we've all been together like this in a, in a panel setting of this kind, um, which I hope conveys to you how important your community is to the governor and the governor's office. Um, we're very excited about it because we work together every day. We love the work that we do, uh, and we engage in a lot of conversation all day long, and it's always useful to us to hear from different communities and different perspectives about things that people care about and want to see more of. Um, I thought I would take just one second to run through a little bit about how our office works, because I do think it's a little bit different than you've seen in past governor's offices. I'm the chief of staff, which basically means I spend my day making sure everybody communicates across departments and across agencies. It was something that was really important to the governor when he came in, that he felt like there wasn't, there was a lot of siloing that happened in state government, and you know, different agencies might be doing the same thing and not talking about it. Um, so I spent a lot of time making sure everybody's having conversations, communicating, getting together on big, important priorities and issues. And then we have four deputy governors, three of which are here today. I'm very upset that Sol wasn't able to join us. Those of you who have seen her in a public speaking setting know she is incredible. She brings a lot of great energy to the room, and she does that in our office every day. Um, but our four deputy governors basically handle all aspects of government and the agencies that report up to the governor. So uh, Deputy Governor Dan Hines oversees budget and the economy. Uh, deputy Governor Christian Mitchell oversees transportation and public safety. Deputy Governor Jesse Ruiz uh, oversees an issue that's near and dear to the governor's heart, education, and particularly early childhood education. And then Deputy Governor Sol Flores uh, oversees health and human services. So every aspect of health and human services in the government is something that Sol um, oversees and handles. And we all really work in a very collaborative way, report up to the governor, um, work on legislation together, and frankly enjoy one another's company quite a bit, which is sometimes unusual in government. So <laughs> um, we are coming up on almost a year in office. Um, it feels like 10 years, but in a good way. Um, I can't quite believe we, we hit the one year mark from the election earlier this month, and on January 14th, it'll officially be a year. And I do think we've had a very successful start to Governor Pritzker's administration. Um, as Representative Hernandez mentioned, we had an incredible legislative session that ended in May, um, where we tackled a number of things that I think are important to communities across Illinois. We started with uh, raising the minimum wage last January. Um, we passed a balanced budget, which I know in Illinois is a big deal. Uh, I was truly amazed when we were working on the campaign the number of times we would hear people, just citizens, um, voters, talk about the budget of the state. You, it's a very rare thing, and, and I know all of you who lived under Governor Rauner know why people cared about it, but, um, but we were very excited to get a budget passed, and it was a very collaborative effort with all the legislators involved. Uh, we passed a capital bill, which includes $45 billion worth of work on roads and bridges and vertical capital across the state, um, which we're very, very proud of. And uh, the thing that often gets talked about the most, uh, we legalized recreational cannabis. <laughs> um, but, one of, but one of the things that we are very proud of in that legislation is it has really been recognized as the most equity-centric uh, cannabis legalization uh, legislation in the country and is being used now as a model in other states for how to look at how they might go about doing it. Um, and we had smaller wins as well. Uh, one of the bills that I know Deputy Governor Ruiz worked on um, involved FAFSA, which is the student financial aid form that seniors fill out. The governor was kind of aghast at the fact that in Illinois, we had one of the lowest rates of students getting financial aid from the federal government because we had a very low rate of, of students filling out that form. Um, it seems like a simple and kind of inconsequential thing, but just making it mandatory for seniors to fill out the financial aid form means that we now have more financial aid dollars coming into the state for our students to go to college. And, um, but we have a lot of work ahead. We know that. Uh, Every day in this job is, you know, there's good things and there's bad things, and we spend a lot of time trying to deal with the things that we don't expect, um, the, the problems that we find that we didn't know about, um, and the efforts that we need to make to be better as a, as a state government. One of the things that we are proudest of, though, um, is that this is the most diverse governor's office that has ever existed in the state of Illinois. Um, as you can see from our panel here, uh, we put a priority not just on having diverse diverse uh, hiring in our office, but diverse leadership at our office. So that the folks who sit with the governor are people who 
have different perspectives, come from different places, um, care about different things, frankly. And I think everybody here would tell you that we tackle issues together. So it, we come at it from kind of all angles. And it's been a unique and really fulfilling experience for me personally. I told someone this has truly been one of the best years of my life and my professional career. I'm a native of Philadelphia, so uh, coming to Chicago has been an interesting experience, but I've enjoyed it a great deal. And I thank you so much for being here, and we're excited to answer your questions today. Thank you, Ann. Uh, so this panel is the Access Accountability and Opportunity. That's what this panel is called. Um, as you know, our um, deputy governors today have been um, pretty much announced. I'm going to ask Senator uh, Christine Castro, who will be um, moderating the first segment. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Her Hernandez. Again, as I mentioned, if you guys have questions, please um, start setting them up. Well, we want this to be an interactive and fun panel. Um, so I'm going to start uh, and, and do a little couple of introductions. Uh, Deputy Governor Dan Hines uh, is the Deputy Governor for Budget and Economy, a former senior executive at UBS Asset Management. Mr. Hines, Deputy Governor Hines, served three terms as the Illinois State Comptroller starting in 1999. He's also a member of the Democratic Party National committee. Uh, I'm going to give uh, Deputy Governor Hines a few minutes if you'd like to go ahead and do an intro. Is this working? Great. Thank you, Senator Castro. Um, and thank you all for allowing us to be here uh, and for all the great, you, uh, great work you do for the state of Illinois. Um, really the only thing I would want to add is to give you a better sense of uh, what my job is in relation to the other deputy governors and, and the chief of staff. Um, we do it, we work very well as a team, work very collaboratively, but we do all have distinct portfolios uh, so that there's the necessary accountability uh, when things go wrong. Um, so the nine agencies that I oversee um, it, our uh, Department of Agriculture, CMS, DCEO, uh, Employment Security, Professional Regulation, Department of Revenue, GAMBI, Department of Labor, and Department of, of Insurance. And uh, when, uh, when it comes to budget and economy, those are the agencies that are really the nerve center for budget and economy. And so I think that as it relates to the Latino community and the issues you care about, uh, you know, these are, these are agencies that are going to be on the front lines, um, making, it, making our economy work, making our government and its budget work for uh, Latinos uh, and Latino communities throughout the state. Um, and we're very proud of the leadership we've put in place within the uh, budget and economy team, starting uh, most importantly with my first assistant deputy governor, Lisa Duarte, who I coaxed out of the private sector. Um, <laughs> Lisa has a Lisa has had a great career in the private and public sector, having worked for Mayor Rahm Emanuel for many years, and finally got back into the private sector and was doing very very well. And uh, only a couple of years later, made the mistake of having breakfast with me. And uh, next thing you know, she's back in government, working in the governor's office. She does a great job. Um, and then also, and I believe they're all here today, um, our Director of Insurance, Rob Muriel, uh, our Director of Real Estate, Mario Trato, our Director of Professional Regulation, Cecilia Bundes, our Director of Financial Institutions, Fran Francisco Machaca, and the Assistant Director of DCO, Michael Negron. Um, we're very proud of that leadership team um, within budget and economy. Uh, and again, I think it just demonstrates what Ann said is that uh, diversity and a commitment to uh, uh, this partnership starts at the top. It starts with the, those that we appoint, those that we consider leaders, and uh, we work very well um, not only in, in you know, addressing the issues that are important to the state of Illinois with respect to the budget economy, but making sure that we, we represent that diversity that is so significant. So 
um, I'll, I'll leave it at that just for introductions. I, I'm anxious to get uh, into some of the details about how these agencies impact the issues you care about, whether it's procurement, hiring, uh, making sure businesses have the, the, the right accessibility and opportunity with our regulatory and economic agencies. Um, but I'll leave that to some of the question and answer. Thank you, Deputy Governor Hines. Christian Mitchell is the Deputy Governor for Public Safety, Infrastructure, Energy, and Environment. Deputy Governor Mitchell represented Chicago's 26th District in the Illinois House beginning in 2013. He has an extensive background in community and political organizing as an, and, and was the Interim Executive Director of the Democratic Party in Illinois, and I might add will be, be graduating law school this December as well. <laughs> Deputy Governor Mitchell. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. And uh, yes, that is the sound of freedom. Um, <laughs> I'm told people have hobbies and friends. Uh, I'm looking forward to figuring out if that's true when law school's over. Um, so I uh, to follow uh, Deputy Governor Hines. I will sort of also lay out my agencies, and then I want to go back through some highlights I think will matter to the people in this room, and then, of course, look forward to your questions. So um, I have uh, public safety, infrastructure, energy, and the environment, uh, which means I have the Department of Transportation. I have the uh, Capital Development Board, uh, the Tollway, which is an independent agency, of which obviously the governor appoints uh, uh, the board, state police, uh, emergency management, National Guard, Department of Corrections, Department of Natural Resources, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, so let me just run through a, a couple of, of highlights. So um, uh, Chief Capera mentioned the Rebuild Illinois Capital Bill, $45 billion, that is going to rebuild our roads and bridges and put money into our vertical infrastructure projects. Um, there will be some, I think, real collaboration between the Department Department of Transportation, CDB, and DCO, so between myself and Deputy Governor Hines and, and, and um, uh, First Assistant Lisa Duarte. Um, I will tell you uh, that we had a meeting with the governor uh, a couple of days ago, and we talked a bit about a bunch of stuff, but one of the, the things was the Capitol Bill. And what the governor said to me um, is that if we look up into this two years in, and the contractors and the people working do not reflect the diversity of the state of Illinois, he's going to be pissed. Um, and, and I believe that, and so will we. And so uh, we want to make sure um, that the people that are going out and doing work on these projects are reflective of the diversity of the state of Illinois, that there are opportunities for wealth and entrepreneurship uh, in communities of color, uh, in black and Latino communities specifically, and that's something that the governor cares deeply about and has charged myself and Dan and Jesse and Ann and everyone else in the office with doing. Um, just a couple other highlights. I will say uh, the executive director of the Tollway I saw earlier, Jose Alvarez, is here. I think I see him there in the back, um, and he's an important part of our leadership there at the tollway and making sure that we have um, the diversity on our projects that we'd like to see. Um, I would also like to give um, on the ISP side where we uh, this year passed a bill for the state police that would say you now need an associate's degree rather than a bachelor's degree to be a state trooper. That's an incredibly important barrier to entry for people of color. Uh, Senator Iris Martinez deserves a special shout out on that. Mm -hmm. um, Just so y'all know, when, I, when Iris calls me lit, I just do what she says. Um, so I got an update for you on that a little bit later. Um, but I want to make sure that both, at this, so when you look at the state police and you look at the Department of Corrections, you have, um, uh, you have two agencies that are important law enforcement agencies that in their, in their forces right now as correctional officers and state troopers are overwhelmingly not people of color, that are involved um, in the justice system with people who overwhelmingly are of color, um, to change the culture of both of those institutions, to change the way criminal justice interacts with our communities, we have to change that. Um, so I look forward, thank you. So partnering with the people in this room to make sure that the people who are protecting us, um, one, look like the people they serve, and two, understand that we are all people to be protected and not population to be controlled. Um, last thing I will add on cannabis, uh, did not see her uh, today, but I do want to give a really significant shout out to Selena Villanueva, who was a great champion on in the cannabis space, as well as Senator Aquino, who I did see here today, uh, in passing the most equity-centric law in the country. Uh, we have an entire designation for social equity applicants 
sense is worth 20% of the points. Uh, we have a system set up to provide loans and working capital to people who are trying to break into the cannabis industry. And furthermore, uh, we are deliberately rolling out the market slowly to make sure that if we look up after the first wave and don't have the kind of diversity we'd like to see from peaceful people disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs, we then do a disparity study and can then go back and do rulemaking in a way that makes sure that we will have diversity of ownership and wealth opportunities in the cannabis space. So very proud of the work we've done and grateful to all of you. Thank you. And I, so just kind of a little background on the panel. So there's two sections of this panel. So we're gonna, this is gonna be first, and then Lisa Hernandez, Leader Hernandez will moderate, we'll take a break, and then we'll moderate the second half. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll also wanna recognize uh, Deputy Governor Ruiz, but he will also do the formal introduction and give a little bit of background in the second segment, uh, as well as in Caprera. But all these questions are all open to all of you, so if you want to chime in, you may as well. So. Uh, the first question, and I will remember this, is uh, last year, the 16th uh, Caucus Foundation Conference, we were asked, uh, and obviously weren't all of you weren't in your roles yet, by many members who were attending on equity. Um, and so this first question kind of is to that. Uh, Governor Pritzker made equity and access a hallmark of this campaign and administration. How are you measuring equity and access across your departments? And what is your current assessment specifically with regard to Latino equity? And you, any of you can answer if you'd like. I can start in there. <clears throat> so I think I want to take a step back for a second and talk about the values that we have as an administration. And I would put diversity and inclusion up as one, one or two in terms of what the government, governor talks about. What we found when we showed up was a government that did not reflect the state of Illinois. And it, it, I have learned a lot about transitioning governments in the last 12 months and how hard it is to move people in and out. But I, I think one thing that we also all learned is that you can't have true numbers and diversity numbers if you are not actually looking at the makeup of these boards and looking at the makeup of your cabinet. And one thing that I watched the governor do for the first three or four months, particularly as we were appointing agency directors, was really stop and say, okay, what does the overall picture look like? You know, are we really going outside of the normal network? And you all know and have seen what the normal network is in Illinois state government. It is overwhelmingly male. It is overwhelmingly white. It is overwhelmingly Irish, apparently. <laughs> um, and I have, I have an, I know, sorry. <laughs> we, we give Dan a hard time, but he takes it well. <laughs> um, and I will say I'm half Italian and half Irish. And de depending on what room I'm in, I, uh, I play one up versus the other. Um, but <laughs> but what we, but what we really attempted to do, and I think we did successfully, and I'll have Christian talk a little bit about it as well, uh, was go outside the normal networks. Um, you know, rely on our people, Sol, Christian, Dan, Jesse, to say, here's somebody I've worked with in the past, here's somebody coming from the caucuses and the legislature. Uh, we, we had great participation with the legislative caucuses. They really didn't just come to us to have these conversations early, but provided lists of names, individuals, people we should think about. Um, and then we went to work, you know, convincing our colleagues across the state that these folks needed to get a look, they needed to be appointed to important jobs. Um, and we look at the numbers. I, we really do. We get a you know quarterly report as to what diversity across the government as well as in the governor's office looks like. I will tell you just off the top of my head, in the governor's office, we have 50% of our staff is what we would we would classify as diverse, um, black and brown, uh, Latino, other communities, Asian. Um, we have more more than 60% of our staff is women. Um, <laughs> say I think about 75% of our leadership team is female so uh, the governor always jokes he's surrounded by women everywhere he looks um, which we like it that way um, but uh, you know look this is hard I would not claim that we are perfect uh, this is something that we feel very strongly we have to work on year after year and the other thing I would say is it's not just about you know finding the people at the top too you have to build the pipeline you know we want to make sure you know do we have people inside these agencies that are working their way up in the leadership ladder? Um, are we promoting from within? 
This is a big value that we've started to talk to, to our agency directors about. You know, are you looking at that young assistant who's doing an incredible job, who can be promoted into middle management, who can one day be the director of the agency? Um, I think that is something that got lost in some past administrations. There was a lot of turnover, a lot of change, um, and we take a lot of time to look at the overall picture. I don't know, Christian, if you want to add. Yeah, I mean, so actually, let me um, let me start by uh, giving a shout out to our token white guy, Dan Hines. <laughs> Um, and I think that um, me and the governor and, right, and the governor he's got a friend um, no look I, but but so part of changing the culture this is not the roast of Dan Hines part of changing the culture is what we've talked about and I want to get back to where Ann was in a second but I also do want to say that it is also important to have people like Dan who know a lot of people who have been who, who had, frankly came up from one of the more famous political families in the state of Illinois to come in and say to be able to go back to their friends and say we're not doing it this way right to go out and find the director of DCO who's an African American woman in her 30s to go out and find a director of the Department of Insurance uh, who is Latino male to so, like to do that and then to exempt that to then go back on these boards and commissions there's one I'm thinking of in particular which I'm not going to get into uh, where people submitted a slate that was literally all white guys and to have not just Lisa but to have Dan go back and say that's not a thing anymore is important that's what allyship is supposed to look like and I think that he and the governor deserve tremendous credit for that um, So, so, so second, I think going back to a point that Ann made, uh, we, I would say we almost, we try to think of almost like a Rooney rule for those of you who are familiar with the NFL, right? So if you are interviewing for a position, if somebody comes back to me and they bring me a resume and it's, and it's only white guys, my question is, you're going to need to go back and look harder. Not that we would say that well, just because someone's a white male, we're not going to hire them, but we know that for years, we, that being people of color, women have been ready and we've just not been asked to step up. And so in this administration, the presumption is that we are ready and that if we are not in the pipeline, you have not looked hard enough, so go back and look again. And I think that that presumption really matters because it matters in every single position that we look at, every single place that we hire. I think one of the things the governor says that I think are, is very important is that what, what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. So to go back to a point that Ann made, you know, for all of my agencies, and I think most of us are doing this, when I look at the Department of Transportation, because part of your question at the beginning, Senator, was how are we doing on it? This is a place where, honestly, we're not doing that great. I mean, I pulled sort of our employee roster, and the numbers for people of color, I think, were under 15%, like total, that being African American and Latino. That number's too low. And so what I've said to the Secretary is every single month, as we start to staff up for the Capitol bill, as we start to let contracts, as we start to push more money out the door, I'm going to be asking you every single month, not just what do your numbers look like for uh, Latinos and for African Americans, but what did you do? How did you change your recruitment strategy? Where did you go? Who did you talk to? Because every single month I'm going to be taking that to the governor, and the governor is going to be measuring us on that. So when you combine a recruitment strategy that presumes that people of color are ready and should be in the pipeline to do the work, and a system that says we are going to measure this and hold ourselves accountable to it, and legitimate empowerment of the people of color in the office, because everyone sort of has their tokens, right? We had a previous administration that I will say I don't think was a friend of people of color, to be gentle, um, that had people of color in the office. But the question is, when they speak, assuming that they are saying the right things, do you listen? And the thing that I really admire about J.B. Pritzker is that he surrounds himself with people, he'd say they're smarter than him, I don't know that I agree with that, but really smart people and really diverse people, and then he actually listens to us. And, and one of the things is to recognize there is some work to be done, right? When you look mm -hmm. at the state population of Latinos is 17% and the workforce here in the state is 6%, and you compare it to African Americans and even Asians, yep. and they're within that mark. So you're it, recognizing that is imperative, and, and I appreciate that you all are re recognizing it, because we hear that a lot. As lawmakers, we hear that a lot. Where is the equity? Where is the equity? Is there equity? Mm -hmm. To the next question that someone asked, I'm going to go, uh, what steps has the governor's office taken or will take to improve Hispanic representation on boards, commissions, leadership positions in the state government. And here I'm going to add one piece to that. How can this room help you if you are in meeting those goals? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I, I just want to say one thing about the previous question, but it also applies to this question, which is um, I thought a lot about these questions and just this whole this issue of, of this issue of equity and diversity. Um, and it, it applies to boards and commissions, uh, which I think you're already seeing an you know, amazing improvement um, and, and representation on our boards and commissions. I, I boil it down to five things um, that have to permeate everything in the governor's office. One is, the first is leadership. Second is a mindset. Third is improving processes. Fourth is outreach. And the fifth is results. Um, and it takes all of those things, not any one thing, um, and it applies to what you know how how our procurement uh, process is. It applies to hiring. It applies to boards and commissions. Um, it applies to policies that come out of the governor's office and through the general assembly. Um, and I think on, on all those, certainly the first four, with the fifth being results, you know TBD, and you should hold us accountable on results every single year. Um, but the leadership and the mindset is very clear, and it comes from the governor himself. And Governor Deputy Governor Mitchell talked about that. Our chief of staff talked about that. It's he has just made it very clear, and he pounds it every single day, and it has permeated through the agencies. Our our directors all believe in it. They they want to accomplish diversity in every respect, and it is it is um, it is ever present. Um, and then in terms of process and outreach, which are which go hand in hand, you know, we have to make the technical mechanical changes to our process to provide opportunities. So for, for in our in our my world, um, when it comes to CMS, for example, we want to we want it's easy easier to promote and, and achieve diversity in the senior levels of government, cabinet members, exempt employees, because you have essentially unilateral decision to do that. But it's much more difficult in the non-exempt positions, in the union positions, in the coded positions, because we don't have as much control there. But there is a way to change that through the process and through outreach. And so the CMS has done already in, in just the first uh, three quarters of this year, made great improvements on our hiring process, making it more efficient and accessible online and making it bilingual, making it uh, uh, more um, uh, readily available to people who may not be able to go all the way downtown to fill out a CMS 100. Uh, we, we have already made those improvements. Um, but going with that is making sure filling out a CMS 100 isn't enough either because the next stage of it is who makes the hiring decision. If it's not an exempt position and it's not by us, who makes that decision? There is a committee, a hiring committee of uh, rank and file employees in the, in, the, in the agency and that committee has to be diverse in itself to, to achieve diversity. So we've made sure that those committees are diverse so that we can get, get rid of the unconscious bias or in some cases a conscious bias that has uh, been a barrier to diversity among employees. So we've changed that process. And then outreach is working with groups like this and many other groups to make sure that people know that these jobs are available and that they can get through those barriers and that they make the uh, fill out those applications. And then lastly is results. And, I, and as I said, we, I think we've already achieved some results, but we're just getting started and we need, you know, we need to be held accountable uh, uh, as this group meets next year and throughout the years, you know, coming back to us and pointing out where we may be falling short and, and, and helping us uh, rectify that situation. And I think the boards and commissions, which is this question, uh, I'll let some of the others talk about it, but I think if you go, you know, across to any board and commission, you'll see that diversity um, reflect uh, the, the commitment of the governor. Yeah, just jump in on boards and commissions. Um, so there are about 1 million and 10 boards and commissions in the state of Illinois. There is a board or a commission for literally everything you could think of. There is, you know, a commission on the, the quality of socks in Illinois. And um, we, have, we have become intimately familiar with all of them. Uh, just to give you a sense of kind of the process, we meet once a week to look at appointments to boards and commissions. And this usually this entire team is in the room room when we do that. Um, so even though it might be a board or commission that Dan Hines oversees or Christian Mitchell oversees, Jesse Ruiz, Ann Capreras, Sol Flores, we're all in the room when those decisions start to get made. And more often than not, what happens is, you know, we get a sheet 
we look at the board, there's usually six or seven people on that board who have been appointed by the previous administration, are serving a seven or eight year term. Um, their term isn't up till 2023. And more often than not, it's all white and it's overwhelmingly male. Um, and so we may have an opportunity to appoint three or four people or one or two people. And this is again to what Dan says where leadership starts at the top. Everyone in our office knows that if you walk in with a list that is all white and all male, the governor is going to laugh you out of that meeting. Um, and it's happened to a couple people. <laughs> um, it's, it's, you know, I think we all have to break kind of the cycle that exists in this political climate where the same people get brought up over and over and over again. Senator Castro asked how you can help. Bringing these names to us, sending us people, going outside even your traditional circle, because look, we're not normal, the people in this room. You're all here on a Friday before Thanksgiving talking about legislative action, and this isn't, this isn't normal America, and that's good. But we need, a lot of these commissions, for example, are looking for very specific skill sets by statute. They have to be, you have to be an EMT to, that, you know, works in a certain jurisdiction to serve on this commission. And the truth is, is that we don't know these people. And a lot of the folks in this room, you may not know them directly, but you may have a network that extends out to those folks. And so continually cycling those resumes through to us. I think the other thing that we spend a lot of time really around values and culture is just talking about how we get out to places that haven't traditionally seen the governor or haven't traditionally heard from members of his administration. And that is a value that we put down on our agency directors. And what happens as a result of that is we meet people who are interesting and who should be involved in state government at all levels. And it's been something that we've worked on continually. But to Dan's point, this is an evolving process. I would never stand up and say to you, it's perfect, we've solved it, we're moving on. <coughs> I, I don't think I'll be able to say that to you seven years from now, because I think this is a much bigger problem than just you know, the Illinois state government. But what I can tell you is if you're looking at the people here on this stage and the governor himself who see this as a deep and personal value for us, and that if we can't at the end of an administration say that we've dramatically improved this metric, then we won't see ourselves as a, as a success. So. I'll add just one quick thing, which is um, use your lawmakers. Um, if we are in a given situation where we have sort of run through a series of boards, I can almost guarantee you that someone's going to say, like, well, have you talked to Senator Castro? Have you talked to Senator Martinez? Have you called Representative Villanueva? Have you called Representative Ma? Like, that, somebody's going to say that, right? And so just keeping them abreast, because they will often be my first call on something. Like, there is a vacancy on this border commission. This is a border commission that does not have a Latino or a Latina. Has anybody talked to Senator Castro, Senator Martinez, et cetera? So make sure you're communicating with your lawmakers um, because they're often going to be the people that we are reaching out to to say, who do you know? Because we know, as somebody who was a lawmaker, um, you know, every all manner of person walks into your office that creates a network of people. And you might something might spark to say, oh, well, I remember when so-and-so walked into my office, they were talking about their experience with emergency management. So this EMT person on the SOC board could be this person. So. Thank you. And not all the boards or commissions are partisan. There's bipartisan, like you said, there's skill sets, there's different education-driven ones. So thank you. Um, according to recent data, Latinos are a driving force in Illinois' labor market. How is the state working to provide greater access to training and career-building opportunities that meet the needs of the business sector? And how is the state planning to connect Latinos in the labor force to emerging employment opportunities such as renewable energy, cannabis, and capital development? No, remember, it's a bifurcated panel, so I was intentionally being quiet to my hour starts in 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, and, uh, and at that point, I get the whole hour. Um, but uh, obviously, it starts with education and uh, some of the pipeline and pathway programs, particularly at community college, where, frankly, Latinos are overrepresented in community colleges. 27% of the community college population and and I'm looking at uh, Laz Lopez, the chairman of our Illinois Community College Board. Uh, Laz, thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, Dr. Torres from IMSA uh, and some of his great students. Yeah, they're already like blowing me away with who's, go who's going to MIT and 
Uh, possibly. Uh, yeah, okay. Congratulations. Uh, and they've all filled out their FAFSAs. Uh, I, I did ask, make sure if you have a uh, high school senior, fill out your FAFSA. Uh, that's federal money that's there for the taking. We need to get more of it and spend it on Illinois colleges and universities. But uh, uh, enough with my, my uh, pontificating on FAFSA. The great programs that we have at community colleges especially uh, help to lead pathways in health sciences, technology, in energy, particularly in renewable energy. Uh, I'm looking at Dr. Gibson at uh, Northeastern Illinois University and Sulema Perez, one of our HSIs in Illinois uh, that also has great pathway programs for our students. We need to do better. We need to have more of our students in, in uh, higher education and four-year universities where we're underrepresented at only 14%, uh, especially in a state where now, uh, we have to remember, we are now a majority-minority state school system. 52% of students, of our two million P to 12 students in the state of Illinois are uh, diverse. White student population is at 47.5%. And that was as of what we were always measuring in a year in, in arrears. So uh, that's only going to get more diverse. Latinos make up the largest group of public school students in the state of Illinois at over 26%. So we need to find pipelines because that is the workforce of the future. Uh, and thus, uh, we have the first ever a uh, non-white male state superintendent of education who also happens to be a Boricua, Dr. Carmen Ayala. Yeah. And uh, chief education officer, Dr. Ernesto Matias, and a uh, chief of communications and policy at ISBE, uh, Irma Martinez Snowpeck. So uh, a strong leadership team at ISBE, leadership at ICCB. Um, we have uh, leadership on the board at IBHE and across the education spectrum and working hard on the P20 Council to make sure all that alignment leads to great pipeline programs and making sure that we are articulating more of our students from those community colleges onto four-year universities if they so choose, and from the high schools to four-year universities. Um, but there are numerous programs, particularly in our teaching field is another area where we need to do better and have more educators of color across the state, uh, African Americans, Asians, and Latinos. Uh, we need to have more diversity in our teacher ranks. We happen to have a teacher shortage in, in many parts of our state, and so there are a number of programs that are working with those students and. Uh, hopefully reaching out to our diverse students. So let me answer this question in, in two parts, Senator. So I think that there are traditional job opportunities that we want to make sure that we look at. So again, as I'm looking at everything we're doing in the Department of Transportation, the Capital Development Board, as we roll out $45 billion worth of projects over six years, it is, you know, what can we unbundle? What pieces of this can we break off? How do you, I mean, and I mean from soup to nuts, from the, um, the, the pavement all the way up to the operating the large machinery, from the person doing the actual work to the lawyer, to to the accountant, to the financial advisor, to every aspect of what it is we're doing in state government. Where is the Latino representation? Where is the representation of people of color? So that's sort of where our head is at and making sure that we are standing up local contractors who are then hiring from local places. Uh, there is also a piece that I think it's important in terms of, again, traditional employment. I'm going to get to the new stuff in a second um, that I think Anne speaks about very passionately, which is that I want to make sure that, and young lady, I didn't get your name, but if you're going off to MIT, that you feel you can come back and work in state government, that it is a good place to work, that it is a place where you can make enough money to raise a family, have decent hours. We are done demonizing state employees because we believe that the state is a good place to work and it should be for everyone in general and for people of color specifically. So I think that's a very important mentality that we share as an administration. To, to your question about sort of newer sectors, I think in cannabis, I talked about it a bit earlier, there is this social equity applicant status um, that all surrounds, yes, ownership, but also incentives for even and majority owners to hire from disproportionately impacted communities, which are overwhelmingly, I want to say, 74% of people in disproportionately impacted areas are people of color, either Latino or African American. So that is another place where we have incentivized employment, they right into the law. And then there's a lot of talk about, uh, about energy. You said renewable energy, for example, Senator Castro. There's a lot of talk about doing a new energy bill in Springfield. That is certainly something coming down the pike at some point. And what the governor said to me and what I will be making sure that we are doing as Deputy Governor 
of our energy and the environment is, if we are going to be creating new sectors, if we are going to be investing in new equipment and new places, the state of Illinois is not going to be doing that if we are not going to emphasize supplier diversity and people going to work and having opportunities for wealth and self-determination. That is a, a just a bedrock principle of this administration. And as for job training and stuff, that's probably more DCEO, so I would, I would let Dan speak about that. So. Um, well, I want to add one thing to on the cannabis um, issue, which is yeah, the 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 um, centerpiece of the cannabis initiative was the social equity and making sure that this is a an industry that ha provides opportunities to people of color. And Senator Toy Hutchinson was uh, gracious enough to uh, leave the Senate to take over for that. But I want to say that. The two key partners to Senator Hutchinson will be Cecilia Bundes, who I introduced er earlier, who is the Director of Professional Regulation. She's in the back. Uh, her, her division will be in charge of licensing, uh, or is in charge of licensing. And then DCO, in terms of the social equity piece, uh, Michael Negron, who is also here, um, is the point person, the Assistant Director of DCO is the point person uh, for cannabis there. So I think uh, that, again, I think just demonstrates that that we're not only talking the talk, but walking the walk. Um, in terms of job training um, and providing opportunities within government, but also those who do business with government, I think it goes back to what I said before, is making sure that our, our processes are working and are accessible to uh, to minorities, but also people who uh, who maybe uh, uh, Spanish is their only language or first language, and that has already been implemented with respect to hiring. Um, secondly, making sure that our a big piece of the capital plan is going to be job training and workforce development, and it's going to be it's going to be throughout all agencies that are implementing the capital plan, DCO, IDOT, um, et cetera. And, and we're, we have to make sure and, and have already begun to make sure that the, the leadership is, is providing the, those workforce development opportunities um, with an eye towards diversity. Um, and then the last thing is in terms of businesses uh, that are, are, are trying to work with the state of Illinois, um, we have re revitalized and really changed the whole uh, outlook and attitude of uh, the BEP program and strategic sourcing within CMS to make sure that businesses have opportunities to work with government, have abilities to, to work through the procurement process of government, and that is going to obviously be uh, critical to our small businesses that are trying to uh, gain those opportunities. All right, one last question, uh, and then we're going to switch moderators. Uh, what can educators do or continue to do to help students get involved, ignite the flame in students to become advocates and politicians for their communities? I'll start, then Jesse. Um, so I was one of those kids who knew I wanted to do politics when I was 12. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you a brief story. I was in uh, Sister Deborah's eighth grade class, and uh, it was the 1992 presidential election, I think. And she said, we're going to do a presidential debate. Um, so the boys will play the candidates. And of course, you know, her hand went up. And I said, well, what about the women? What about the girls? And so I remember Sister Deborah kind of thinking for a second. She goes, well, I guess we could have the wives on stage with them. <laughs> so. <laughs> wow! It was 1992, folks. You know, they, they, we were things were things were rough. Um, so I played uh, Mrs. Bush um, <laughs> with uh, with the quarterback of the football team, Patrick Scanlon, and I. And uh, Patrick said not a word during that debate. I think I argued the Bush tax cut plan for. <laughs> 45 minutes, um, and I remember getting to the end of it and thinking, wow, this is what I want to do. Um, you know, I, I am passionate about this because I've spent my entire career around politics and around government. And I think that what has been done in this country by a certain segment of the political partisan agenda is make it a bad thing to work in government, to be an elected official to serve your state or your country in this capacity. 
and it's a disgrace that that's been done because the work that we do every day we feel very passionate about and we meet people every day who work in state government who have been there for 10, 20, 30 years, whose fathers or mothers were part of state government, who care about the work that they do and who have listened to themselves be denigrated for just years upon years upon years. And I can imagine what kind of effect that has on students as they're coming up in you know, high school and college and thinking about what kind of career do I want to have, what kind of um, opportunities do I want to look at. I was very fortunate. I, I, I had an opportunity to go to school in Washington, D.C. Um, I interned all over Capitol Hill. I worked in a lot of different jobs. And my first real political job was with Emily's List, uh, working to help get women elected across the country. And I got to go all different places to do that. Um, we have to make, we have to change our values around this. And we have to be willing to get out and say to kids who are going through school, this is a great job. This is, you know, you are the ones that are going to shape the kind of issues that we care about, the policies that we look at. And that has to start at a young age. I'm a little biased on that because for me it started when I was literally in the eighth grade. Um, and I would hope that the opportunities that students have nowadays aren't, you know, busting their way into a presidential debate as the wife of the candidate. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think I was watching the, uh, you know, not to get too partisan, but I was watching the Democratic debate the other night and thinking, gosh, look at this stage. You know, we have a long way to go, but how far have we come? And what must it be for a student in high school, a student in college to look and see this array of candidates and understand that this is, you know, what our party can stand for, what our country can stand for. I know that the man in the White House right now is, brings everybody down. But I think what we've tried to do in Illinois is be a bright spot in the country for the last year. And just say, look, people of different parties, people of different affiliations, people of different backgrounds can work together to get real things done for real people. And when we talked about the Capitol bill, I don't understand the mentality that looks around and sees a bridge or a road falling down and says that shouldn't be something that we spend time investing in. That's our communities. And frankly, I grew up with a grandfather who was Republican. But it was part of his value system and his pride in the country that we invested in things like roads and institutions and missions to the moon and all these other things. And we have to kind of get back in some ways to that mentality where public service is, is something that's noble and important and that we send our best people to go do. That it's not, a, you know, it's not something that you know, just comes along because you can't do anything else. Um, I certainly hope it's 20 years on this kind of work that that's not where I've been. This is, this is something I care a great deal about. And um, I think the governor, <laughs> J.B. Pritzker could be doing a lot of things with his life. <laughs> he really could. And there were times in the campaign where I looked at him and I said, do you really want this job? <laughs> And he, you know, he would always laugh, and then he would kind of be like, yeah, I really do. And if you talk to him, he'll tell you he loves being governor. He loves it. And he loves it because he loves to walk into a room like this and talk to every single person, hear from all of them about what they care about. The legislators, I think, will tell you he calls them, and he calls them into his office, and he wanders the halls. And you know, he's just somebody that really relishes the work. And I think we need to see that. I think we need to see that at all levels of government. It's something that all of us on stage really care about a great deal. And I hope for all of you, as you're out kind of talking about these things, that you're proselytizing to kids who are coming up. We want people to come to state government. We want the talent to come into our room and say, give us a job, you know, put us on the field. Um, and that's something that I think we're going to spend a lot of time over the next couple of years understanding how we can foster more of that um, in our youth, particularly in Illinois. Uh, a number of things come to mind, but the but, um, uh, first thing that comes to mind is my, my freshman year at the University of Illinois, where uh, I, I quickly joined a fraternity, had a lot of fun, uh, did not focus on my engineering degree so much, uh, thus I don't have an engineering degree. Uh, <laughs> I have an economics degree uh, when I finally got serious. Uh, and, and I remember meeting this young woman at a fraternity party who, who uh, I did not realize was Latina and uh, to talked to me about you know, going and supporting events at La Casa, um, which is the Hispanic Cultural Center down in Champaign, uh, now in Urbana. 
Uh, and I was like, you know, I, I, I don't need that. You know, I was, you know, I graduated top of my class in high school. I was a hotshot engineering student, so I thought, uh, until the university advised me otherwise. Uh, and, uh, and she's like, where do you get off? You know, you probably benefited from being Latino, you know, getting into that college of engineering, which I probably did. Uh, and you owe something back. Uh, and I was like, wow. I'm like, I should date this woman, which I did for three years. Uh, <laughs> like, and she was very smart and taught me a lot, but one thing she taught me was that I owe an obligation for um, not only my position there to my community, and think about it, like to many of us, our parents. My dad came here with a third grade education as a migrant farm worker, bent over in you know, hot fields way too many hours a day, picking crops all over the US so that I can go to the University of Illinois. And I thought, hmm, if nothing else, I owe that guy an obligation to do something for my community and students like me who benefited from people like that. And so that kind of sparked something for me. So I think that former girlfriend of mine. Uh, and, and ever since then, um, I've always been very acutely aware of that obligation. Uh, and whenever I get upset that you know we're not doing so well, uh, I realize either put up or shut up. And, and step up into the arena and do something about it, or you know, you, you don't have a lot of standing to, to say much. And so I started always getting engaged, and luckily, um, something that propelled that engagement was you know this this caucus, where a couple of then members reached out. Um, I thought I saw Mary Beth Mermal walk in there, yeah, who, who uh, friend of a friend, and gave up my name, and, and uh, Mary Beth referred me to. Uh, then Senator Miguel del Valle and then State Representative Ed Acevedo who reached out and said, you're the only Latino corporate lawyer we can seem to find in this city. Would you, <laughs> would you help us form a caucus and a foundation? And in the summer of 2002, I did. Uh, and, and thankfully then when the Latino caucus had an opportunity to recommend somebody for, to the State Board of Education, um, they recommended their lawyer and specifically Miguel del Valle which carried that bill to reform the State Board of Ed which put me on a totally different path. Um, but by willing to help, by willing to be engaged, by willing to be in the arena, and yes, I was a partner in a law firm billing way too many hours, and, but thank God every once in a while I put my head up and remembered I have an obligation to this community. I have an obligation to pay back my dad, not him personally, but at least to hopefully help students like he helped me and honor his memory by hopefully helping some of those 26% and all of those 2 million students, but in particular, you know, folks in my community who supported me, who made it possible for me to have the life I've had. So for particularly the young students, um, seek out those opportunities, no jobs too big or small, uh, and they will lead to other things. Uh, and a friend of a friend will give your name to somebody one day that will put you on a totally different path and then step off that path and make it a full-time job instead of just a side volunteer public service role. Um, I'll add just one really quick thing. Um, uh, I think that especially when you're a kid, um, uh, your imagination is limitless, but it is helped along by seeing people who look like you. Um, and by seeing possibility and by seeing that you can be a thing. And, and I think that's true, by the way, on both sides of the coin. I think that when I think about the Obama presidency, I think not just about its impact on people of color, but also on white folks who are seeing a black man be in office and be respected. And I say all that to say, um, you know, when I was a state rep, uh, we get a lot of event requests, as I'm sure either of the senators can tell you. The ones that I never turned down were anytime somebody asked me if I wanted to speak in eighth grade graduation or high school, uh, because I never saw that. Um, I never saw anyone who looked like me um, in a position of public service. And it wasn't until I got to college that I saw that. And so, you know, um, obviously I'm not Latino uh, and I can't speak for, you know, Jesse or Sol who's not here, but I would say, at least for me, like if there is a place that you want, I think any of us to be, to come out and speak to kids or to, or a youth group or to demonstrate to them that public service is a thing that you can do and make a decent living at. I mean, I'll speak for myself, but I will say that I'm always willing to do that because I think that if you can can see it, you can achieve it, and I think that being able to see it is very important. So, all right. Well, there's time for a short break, or do, do we should we just keep going? All right. Well, let's keep going. Leader Hernandez. I 
don't know. No, no, no. no. Okay, are we ready to go or are we wanting just a little bit of a break? We can give like a five. Just, let's just take five minutes. Nope. Okay. Okay. So, just a reminder we do have the papers if anybody has questions. There you go. So we're going to go right into then the uh, next next segment of this panel, and uh, we're we you know so is not Flores is not here. Uh, however, uh, we're going to have a. a Ann Caprara, uh, the Chief of Staff, give just a little, little bit of synopsis in terms of um, the human services um, area, and then, then we'll go on to Jesse DeReese, we'll talk a little bit on the education piece. Great. So, um, sure. Ann. Um, it is virtually impossible to give a little bit of a synopsis of Sol Flores. Um, she is truly, uh, you know, we, we, we care a lot about culture in our office and, and, you know, how we interact and how we talk to one another and how we bring up the, the next generation of people who's working with us. And Sol really personifies this for us, so I'm, I'm sorry she's not here today, but um, I love working with her. And I know she, she wishes she could have been here. She does oversee the health and human services um, aspects of the government in many ways. I think all of us would probably agree she probably has the most difficult job of anybody here on stage. Um, under her purview, she oversees HFS, DHS, uh, DCFS, um, anything having to do with hospitals, Medicaid, healthcare in the state um, is really what Seoul takes care of and looks after. She also oversees human rights um, commission and board, and I know we have several members of the team here today. Um, but she is uh, the person that really makes sure that we, those departments are talking to one another because I think one of the things, I said this at the beginning, and really with Seoul's sphere of influence, it's, it's the place where we needed the most work in terms of different agencies were doing some of the same work and not talking to one another, or having information about uh, people that we serve, particularly in very vulnerable communities, that was not being shared in a way that would help us maximize um, the services that we provide. So, uh, you know, Seoul comes from a background working with um, some of the most vulnerable populations in Illinois. She brings an incredible amount of empathy and understanding, but also a real iron will um, in getting done what needs to get done in these particular areas. And I will just add really quickly, I think one of the legislative items that we are going to be taking a look at for the upcoming legislative session um, is how we can improve health care delivery in the state of Illinois. Um, some of those are smaller things and some of those are rather transformational things. Um, so just two days ago I sat in a meeting with Sol and her kind of entire healthcare team uh, to discuss what could we do and what could we be thinking about, uh, particularly when it pertains to the ACA and what the federal government is doing at the moment to try to gut Obamacare. How can Illinois make sure that we are uh, providing health care to communities and to individuals who have come to rely on that service over the past few years. May I say something? Um, Do you mind if I say something? Let me, let me just finish with sure. uh, um, Deputy uh, Ruiz on just the, the education. We could go to questions then. Okay. I was okay. just gonna, I was just gonna praise Sol Flores, so I could wait on that though. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, she's she's gonna get a lot of praising because she's gonna get praise from me too. There's a list of things that I just want to just list on what she's done. Uh, Jesse. Sure. Uh, quickly, education is everything from birth to higher education. Let's say so it includes agencies like the Illinois State Board of Education, which in turn oversees 852 school districts, some who behave better than others at times, uh, Illinois Community College Boards, uh, which can, has 48 community colleges uh, and systems, and the Illinois Board of Higher Education, which oversees the four-year, uh, the 12 four-year colleges and universities, the Illinois Student Assistance Commission, which administers 
MAP grants uh, and AIM High scholarships, uh, and also helps on trainings and encourages completion of the FAFSA. Did I say complete your FAFSAs, everybody? <laughs> Make sure you spread the word. Um, and then the P20 Council, the Early Learning Council. We just had our fir first school construction task force meeting that will put forth a new uh, recommendation on how we fund construction of, of uh, P to 12 facilities in the state. And then uh, next month we will stand up an early childhood education and care funding commission as was done a few years ago in Illinois where we reformed how we fund uh, P to 12 education in the state. We now have a uh, evidence-based funding formula. We will seek to have a similar funding reform mechanism for early childhood education and look at how we completely fund uh, early childhood uh, in Illinois with the disparate funding streams that are blended and braided, but seeing if we can do a better job of bringing them more cohesively together. And then, just for fun, we threw in the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum that also <laughs> falls in my portfolio. Um, and uh, uh, it is, uh, now has a new board that is, uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, the accountant for um, the foundation, Martin Sandoval, Martin Sandoval CPA, not the senator, uh, is, is um, uh, two different individuals, uh, is on that board uh, as well. And so that is the portfolio, uh, brings a lot of different challenges, a lot of from one day talking about uh, adult students in higher education to infants and toddlers in preschool and, um, and child care. So it's a... Uh, it's a diverse and robust portfolio that uh, keeps us fairly active. Thank you, Jesse. Sorry to interrupt you, Deputy Heinz, but please uh, add to Seoul's uh, just accomplishments and... Well, I figure since I'm sitting here, I'll say something. Uh, no, I, I do want to actually, since Seoul's not here, uh, there are days when I think I have, I'm having a tough day or something with a lot of pressure, I just remind myself, thank God I'm not Sol Flores because <laughs> she has the most sensitive portfolio, I mean, you can imagine. So in one year, so should DHS, DHFS, DCFS. In one year, she's had to dealt with a, a measles outbreak, two hospital closings, and then just the daily tragedy and sadness and urgency of DCFS, which you know goes without even explaining. Um, and she handles it with just incredible calm and uh, just just firmness and fierceness. And she's she's just an amazing person. Um, so I just wanted to add that. That's all. Yeah. And then let me add. Not to mention the census, mm -hmm. $29 million invested that the governor signed, and she has put it together from, basically, we had nothing, uh, nothing put together. This is from just, just nothing, really, to what it's evolved, and so uh, that's a, a pretty heavy lift, not mind you, the child uh, care assistance program that she's had to deal with, and it, and it goes on. Because uh, I, when she was when she was um, chosen to be the uh, DHS uh, deputy, um, I was wow. How is she really going to get her rounds? It's it's a huge uh, endeavor, especially leaving the previous administration how they left it. So to pick it up from there and then just add all these others, uh, truly she ha has been doing amazing work. However, it's still. There's, there's work to be done. You know, with the 17, as Senator Castro mentioned, 17% of the state uh, uh, representation. How are we going to, how is she going to meet some of those gaps in terms of um, uh, uh, areas like, um, if I could go back, she, um, Oh, I, I took a blank right now. But what I wanted to get to was the welcoming centers, the infrastructure for that, the immigration piece that she's uh, trying to establish. They're really kind of revamping all of that. So I, I truly um, appreciate that piece, how hard she's working on that. But there's still some gaps where we're looking, you know, to work on some sort of uh, some representation and then really putting that um, 
that uh, program, I wouldn't call it program, but that division of immigration and what it, um, how it, it is broken up. One area which is, I, I do want to just raise, and see maybe you can talk to this, is uh, there is the Office of uh, Hispanic uh, Latino Affairs, which um, uh, oversees the decrees, the decrees that really impact our communities and who that has not really been um, uh, really, uh, the compliance issue is a, a problem. So for her to be trying to make sure that we have the correct representation there uh, and how we're going to move on on that area is, is something that I, you know, uh, am interested in hearing if anybody can talk to that. Um, and on, in terms of the education, I, you know, I just want to also salute on the inroads that have been taking place uh, with some of the legislation pieces. Well, However, I, I would just say if I could pause you for a moment and, and salute you, uh, mm -hmm. the RISE Act. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's groundbreaking. You and the Latino Caucus, that was historic. That was historic, and I was very proud to see the debate in the Senate uh, and that vote successfully on Latino Unity Day. Um, incredibly appropriate, so thank you for the Rise Act. No, 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 and that's all due to, to the uh, support of the governor's office and making that happen. Um, but, you know, we had the SSA plan Put implemented, we have evidence, the evidence base uh, also implemented. So inroads, right? We've made inroads, but it's still, again, you know, we, you know, it's the uh, access equity that that is um, a, the area that we're still concerned. So work to be done. I'm just raising that because it's work to be done. But anyway, um, let me get to some questions. If there's any comments on sort of this scenario, uh, happy to hear any comments. If not. I would just say I also like soul floors a lot. <laughs> <laughs> say that. For the record, me too. <laughs> Say, poor soul, she's not here. Um, we do an office activity once a month as a group, and uh, our first one was we took uh, we took a circus class. We did acro like the trapeze. Whose idea? You have not lived until you have seen Soul Flores <laughs> work on how to like take the trapeze across and then jump onto the other trapeze. It was she. She is such a light in our office. No pun intended, but like she is. I, I, I just, I care so much that she is, she's part of our community, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we love so. We love so. We love so. Um, let me start with the, the first, uh, a question um, that we had um, set up already to start off sort of the conversation. Governor Pritzker made equity and access a hallmark of this campaign and administration. How are you measuring equity and access across your departments and what is your current assessment uh, specifically with regard to Latino equity? And this can go to like all. Sure, all I'll, I'll start. I mean, I mentioned, you know, ISB, which is the largest grouping of students uh, in the state, our P-12 students. And, and again, you know, going way outside the box that I believe is after 130 something years of uh, continuous white male leadership that we finally put in a woman and finally put in a, a Puerto Rican woman uh, to lead that agency who comes from a different perspective uh, and obviously something that is, is everything she does, you will hear Dr. Carmen Ayala talk about equity and they're engaged in doing a strategic plan and it is the main pillar of that plan to make sure that every student is receiving the opportunities that they deserve uh, and, and that they need to have. And especially, again, I always think of this endeavor, uh, it, it's self-interested. I mean, this is our future. If we don't get this right, frankly, um, you know, our, our state's in jeopardy. So we have to do this work properly. And if given that this is the largest group coming through the pipeline, uh, we have to make sure that uh, they have all the resources they need to fulfill their potential. Um, and case in point, I'm looking at the young students uh, here from, from Northeastern, uh, and they're from IMSA, and um, this is what can happen when, uh, when we get it right. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it goes back to comments I made before. I would say that in terms of leadership, if you look across um, my portfolio, whether it's people at the top or like, like, like Jose Tolway, but also, you know, first deputies at ISP, et cetera, I think the leadership is pretty decent uh, as it relates to Latino representation. I think the place where we fall down uh, is line employees uh, and contracting. And those are both things that I'm paying very close attention to, but ones that I'm going to look to work with the people in this room, uh, with your caucus leadership and others on, because I think, you know, looking up, and seeing, for example, the Department of Transportation, where I think the number I remember is like 70% of the employees are white men. Like, that doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Um, so what can we do to get more people from Northeastern, from IMSA, from uh, other state agencies into um, to, to consider this to be good employment is sort of the question. And how do we make sure that we are putting a laser focus on getting um, more uh, Latinos pre-qualified to be contractors at CDB, at IDOT? What are other sort of common sense things we can do? One initiative we're working on that's being led by um, Jesse Martinez at CDB is like, how do we look at saying, if you're certified at the city of Chicago, why do we have to recertify you at the state? level. If you're certified at Cook County, why do we have to recertify? As long as you're, uh, the requirements are substantively in line, why are we wasting everyone's time? Because that is a barrier to entry for folks. So what are the common sense things we can do to get more uh, Latinos into, into our agencies is sort of the thing that I'm very focused on. Because again, leadership, we do pretty well. I think as it relates to mainline employment opportunities contracts, there's more work to be done. And I want your help in doing it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to um, move to the next question. So what is being done to support Latinos' academic recruitment and retention programs across all institutions, but specifically Hispanic-serving institutions and historic programs uh, such as the NIU Proyecto Palente en Enlace? Yeah, I mean, the most important thing we did, and, and kudos to the governor, and something you, you, you wouldn't think we'd have to take for granted, but if you ask you know, President Gibson and her uh, uh, other eight colleagues, presidents of our university, not having a budget was decimating to higher education in this state. Absolutely decimated our system of higher education, and, and uh, uh, it showed. And especially when we see the students who need that support most uh, are our students of color and our underrepresented students. Um, that was devastating. Having a budget that passed on time, that provided a 5% increase to our, our uh, colleges and universities, that provided an increase to community colleges, that provided an increase to the MAP grant, that now we, and we live in a state that now has the RISE Act that allows undocumented students to access MAP grant funds. That's you know the, the greatest thing we can do is properly support our institutions, who in turn, uh, and and I could hand the mic over to President uh, Gibson and Suleiman, do the hard work on the ground every single day, and Dr. Jose Torres and Laz and the other you know career educators in this room who do the ha, uh, do the work under ha, have all the programs, but they need the support from the state, and we encourage that. We have board members who ask about this at all our boards, and and uh, uh, that is the the number one thing we can do. The other important thing that a uh, number of, of folks in this room and, and uh, the IRC, that is one of the, the Illinois Resource Center that helps put uh, Ron uh, and his team at the IRC pushing for the seal of biliteracy. That when Carmen was uh, a superintendent, Carmen Ayala, you know, helped push for that in our state, giving students another credential to help them on their path. And so that's something that not many other states have. We have it in Illinois. It gives uh, another credential to our students for having that, that ability of, of navigating the world in multiple languages. Yeah. Senator Martinez's bill. Exactly. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yes. 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 Um, so I'm going to take a question from the audience. Uh, Governor Pritzker has pushed millions uh, to let me see if I can read to road and bridges to be repaired. Will the governor push for more school funding statewide, especially especially to communities with low income families? Uh, yes, there's a two-part question there, roads and bridges, but schools, um, we've increased the, through evidence-based funding, 
Uh, this year was well over $300 million, record increases, uh, record increases in uh, MAP grant funding. We're going to double that over the course of the governor's administration. So there's uh, incredible amounts, of, as I mentioned, the increases to community college and, and universities as well. So huge investments in education, more to come, more to do. But uh, now with the evidence-based funding where you have the tier one schools receiving uh, a, a greater share of those funds, and we're equitably distributing those funds, and again, looking to start the commission to look at that uh, for early childhood as well, and one day I'm sure we'll get there on the uh, higher education front where we'll have a different funding formula for higher education to make sure we're targeting those uh, incremental amounts of funding to those communities that need that support and pinpoint those dollars so they do the best and greatest help to those students who need it most. So I'm getting loaded here with questions, but we're gonna try to do our best on uh, answering as many as we can. Um, let me uh, switch it over here to, um, okay, here's an, what plans and initiatives are being implemented to move towards a greater equity in academic achievement for Latinos? What can we look forward to in the coming months to increase Latino access? and equity to educational opportunities. Uh, you know, again, most of it is funding. Most of our students who have a barrier, it's the barrier is financial. And so encouraging the FAFSA uh, completion rate, and the MAP grants and the AIM High, and making sure that we're getting that funding to the students, and then overall working on the overall affordability of, of higher education. Now, because the state fell down on its obligations of not supporting our institutions of higher education, they were forced to go to the only other revenue stream they really have, and that is tuition. Uh, and that would put them in an untenable position of having to you know, price out students, make it more difficult for students to access that. I mean, I got, you know, my dad was already retired when I went to college. They, they weren't able to help me with a dime. I was able to go down to Champaign with 300 bucks in my pocket and come out four years later with an economics degree and, and, and only $10,000 in debt. You can't do that today. It's not possible. So today, I would not have been able, my career wouldn't be possible. That's not acceptable. Somebody who you know comes from a you know low education household, low income household, should be able to pursue the American dream. That is the premise of our country, and so we need to make that completely possible to this day. And we're going to continue to work on funding in both MAP grants and helping students directly, as well as funding our universities to make sure they don't have to turn to students to make sure to provide the world class education they need to provide them. Okay, early childhood here. Distribution of early childhood funding uh, currently uses prioritization of high need areas in a, as a tool to allocate funding. Moving forward, how will the governor's office ensure that that prioritization of high needs areas has greater weight in deciding distribution funding? I think I mentioned an early childhood education and care funding commission, and that is the point to making sure that we have some great programs uh, in this state. You know, we, we were uh, leading the nation when we passed preschool for all back in 04, I believe it was, uh, and, and we slipped. We disinvested, and we weren't, we weren't strategic on where those funds needed to be, and following demographic shifts. We have swaths, and frankly, downstate is a greater concern where there are just deserts of need, and we have populations of students who are not being served. We also are, are not paying our higher education teachers enough. They are some of the most underpaid professionals in the education system, uh, and so we need to rec rectify that and attract more teachers. And frankly, you know, today, if we put in more funds, the infrastructure doesn't exist. Uh, to make sure that we can serve all the need that exists. So that is the focus of, and there's already been a lot of work uh, plugged to the Boston Consulting Group, who on a pro bono basis did a lot of work of setting the stage for this commission that'll kick off in a few weeks. And so it will be a substantial amount of work, but it'll be historic and groundbreaking work that'll make sure that we become a leader in the nation on early childhood, second to none, and that we will serve truly all students, and particularly those students who, who you know, it's well documented that for whom an early childhood education will 
close the achievement gap that exists today and will put them on a completely different path for the rest of their lives. Sure. I just want to uh, provide some context to that. So um, Jesse's the expert in, in all the programs he mentioned are the, the ways to accomplish what the question asked. But the, the question is, how do we continue to do this? And the answer is two words, fair tax. Fair tax. Yeah. And I, I just want to take the opportunity to plug that initiative of the governor's. All the things that are providing educational opportunities and, and making sure we have uh, the best education system in this country uh, is fundamental, is based on passage of the fair tax. Because all the, initi all the investments we've made so far have, be have been very difficult to, uh, to do with the financial constraints that we have. So we urge everybody to get involved in the fair tax debate. Um, and make sure that we uh, we pass that in November of 2020. And that's a good example of the collaboration that happens up here and, and with Seoul as well. You know, early childhood, Department of Human Services, DCFS, State Board of Education, Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development, all work together. And so we need to work together to make sure it all works. Uh, when I want to make sure that the universities who need their capital uh, get their capital, I walk over to Christian and say, can you help me? And he does. And when I want to make sure that there's more funding for early childhood. I walked down the hall and I'm like, Dan, I just got the easy job. You've got the hard job. How are we going to pay for it? Uh, and he produced it, but he's right. We need to, to, to pass the fair tax. And so keep your ears tuned. And for younger folks, this is your future. Uh, you want an issue to mobilize on? This is it. Make sure we have a fair tax in Illinois so that it can continue to fund our higher education system and, and frankly, our entire education system. Early childhood can be complicated and the fact that it ends in different departments yep. is what, knowing that you're working together because the silo piece of it is what has been in the past become problematic. So it's, it's we, essential that we ask to our, our uh, early childhood centers and our schools to blend and braid federal and different streams of, of funding from different state departments that don't always coincide and gel and work as well together. Some of them work incredibly hard and do it uh, as well as co possibly can be, be expected. We need to make it easier so they don't have to do somersaults to provide the services for young children they need yeah. to provide. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to take a question from a student. Um, so as it was stated, Illinois has uh, now adopted a new law that requires high school seniors to fill out the FAFSA application in order to graduate. However, in order uh, to be suc uh, to successfully complete the application, students must have a social security or ITIN number. Does this mean that the undocumented students will not be able to graduate for failing to successfully complete the FAFSA? No, it does not. Uh, no student will not graduate because of failure to complete the FAFSA. There is a very strong waiver built into the bill that says if for whatever reason you cannot or you just choose not to fill out the FAFSA, you fill out the waiver and you have completed the requirement and your school must graduate you. So the waiver form will be available uh, at all schools, it'll be discussed, so fill out the FAFSA. I encourage those who can to do it. You don't know what your future plan, some folks, I don't plan on going to college. Well, you, you might, and if you want to go and pursue a, a um, career or technical program or go to community colleges, FAFSAs can get you money for that as well. So fill it out, gives you options. If you can, if you cannot, fill out the waiver and you have completed your graduation requirement. And can I just add to that that I think one of the things we were trying to address with the legislation is truthfully, depending on where you go to school and what high school you're in, what their focus is, you're either are or not being exposed to the things that help you get to college if you want to go. Um, I was very fortunate. I went to a school that every step of the way they were focused on college, 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 college. So there was a guidance counselor that made sure you filled out the form and they were looking at your AP classes and your extracurricular activities. We recognize that that's not the educational experience that everyone has. So what we want to do is make sure that students are getting exposure to the things that can help them 
if they might not have the resources to go to school or frankly that you know people in their lives who are saying pay attention to this focus to this focus on this you know it's important that you think about college so you know Jesse did an incredible amount of work on this bill when we passed it last spring um, but we we did make sure that we build in a waiver so that if if colleges is not what you're looking at or or there are barriers for you to, to filling out that form it's not going to affect your graduation okay I'm so I'm going to kind of turn it to uh, let's see if we can answer it's health care so someone from the audience uh, asked, asked this question a variety of uh, research studies from University of Illinois and Equal Hope, formerly Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force, show poor ca uh, quality care, in particular for uh, cancer care in Medicaid. Rauner's administration um, stalled the Metropolitan Quality Program um, and never implemented the Breast Cancer Excellence in Screening and Treatment Act. What will the printer administration do to restart and improve the health equity initiatives. Is that? Did anybody want to go? That's a, I think that's a soul this is question. A soul question. Yeah. The, the amazing soul, soul I'm sure, is working on it right yeah. now. And, uh, I will say, just to the point that this was, every day is like finding a new landmine from the Rauner administration, I have to be honest with you. Um, you know, when we came in, we were dealing with the immediate crisis of the debt that had piled up. Um, and I'll give you just a very dumb but important example. Uh, we have a DC office that the governor's office staffs to f lobby the federal government. The rent hadn't been paid in a year. I don't know how, how we weren't evicted. Um, you know, so we, t we mentioned the measles crisis earlier this year, uh, and for whatever reason, the Rauner administration wasn't seeking the federal match um, on vaccination efforts in the state. We got ourselves back in that program. Um, so, you know, we are constantly looking for and discovering areas where the state has fallen down over the last four years, six years, um, and working to get ourselves back into those programs. So I'm sure that this is something that Sol is taking a look at, but I took a note and I'm gonna take it back to her, so. Okay. Okay, this is, I think, more like a comment. So another student, I am a first generation Latina and a product of the CPS City Colleges of Chicago and now the first BSN, BSN, BSN registered nurse in my family. Congratulations. That's Jalen Carmen Perez. You are all doing an amazing job because I would not be here if it weren't for people like you believing in students like me. Thank you. So I figure it's Jalen um, Perez. Okay, so while there are good news in terms of Latinos pursuing higher education at unprecedented rates, the retention and graduation rates are not encouraging, especially at the community college level, which is an entry point for a large segment of young Latinos. What efforts are underway or being planned to improve accountability and move the needle in college completion? In fact, our Illinois Board of Higher Education is meeting this afternoon, I think starting at noon, uh, and starting a retreat on its uh, strategic plan. It's a one-year effort. Uh, it hasn't been done in 10 years, unfortunately, so we've got some catch-up to do. Uh, but one of the efforts uh, will be, and one of the initiatives in that plan that I will ensure happens, is accountability on this front. That uh, something that I know Arnie Duncan who was at the U.S. Department of Education uh, really imposed on for-profit colleges and universities, but all colleges and universities have to be accountable for results. Uh, you know, you can't just recruit your students, you need to keep your students and graduate your students and making sure that they are on to successful careers and gainful employment. Uh, and so we have gainful employment rules at the federal level for private colleges or for for-profit colleges and universities. Uh, we need to ensure that we're measuring the results and tracking the results for those institutions uh, and rewarding those efforts and, and, and encouraging those efforts uh, further for those folks who are not having as much great success and focusing on those populations of students 
students who need extra systems of support and also something that Carmen Ayala is very focused on in ISBE's plan is systems of support for students to make sure they're uh, achieving the success they need to achieve to get onto either careers or colleges and universities. So I have more of a, I guess, letting you know. This is from uh, uh, Julieta Rosales. She's a uh, Pasco. She's a psychologist uh, referring to ISBE. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not have any Latino professional working, working in bilingual special education, either, neither in Chicago nor in Springfield. Um, she also says that ISB, ISBE is monitoring bilingual and special ed. She's, in other words, she's saying it's zero. There's no monitoring. Um, and then there's the third, uh, please answer. So she's, she's looking for some kind of response. Sure, and you can come see me afterwards, but uh, I mean, I can tell you, uh, when I was interim CEO at Chicago Public Schools, you're right that it, that school district was not, and the state in turn was not monitoring um, the compliance with you know providing uh, bilingual education services that by law students are entitled to receive. Uh, there, they, I did a first time audit ever in that, brief three and a half month period I was there and um, there's federal money that support these efforts so it's kind of you know self-inflicted wound by not doing what you're supposed to do so you can get the money uh, and so the Carmen in fact is a uh, is a uh, bilingual teacher uh, Irma Martinez Snopek, uh, head of policy, started her career seven years in a second grade CPS classroom as a bilingual teacher. Uh, she herself was a bilingual student, and so I know there's a strong commitment uh, at the state level as well to ensuring that those uh, students receive. So we do have, particularly in the special, special education area, and, and for uh, bilingual speech pathologists, uh, we have a teacher shortage, but we have an acute shortage in those areas that's teachers who have those skill sets. And so we are working on those pipeline programs to make sure we can attract folks. Um, thank God the governor signed a bill making sure that we are paying our teachers uh, you know, adequately and so that there's a minimum wage. So regardless of which of those 852 school districts you choose to work in, and we need you know, qualified teachers in all of them, but that you're paid fairly. Thank you. Um. Jesse, I, um, I think this, it's important because of the era that we're living that we read this as just more um, calling attention to the reg refugee sort of crisis that we're in. Let me, this is from, I believe it's a uh, elementary school teacher. Okay, my name is Brenda Cavillo. As a Mexican American, my elementary school experience has detrimental effects on my bicultural identity. My relationships with my family and my academics academics, which is exactly why I decided to become a teacher. I am a second grade teacher of Parkwood Elementary in Hanover Park, and I am battling with burnout this year. I know about coping strategies and about self-care, but in my opinion, that is not good enough. I don't want anyone telling me about needing to be more resilient in a system that is built for me and the students that look like me to fail. It is not a solution to the injustices I see Latinx students experiencing. I have 28 second graders this year. My large class is not conducive to my emerging bilingual students who need individualized instruction and attention. We need to push for smaller class sizes for Latinx students, especially the ones who live in the low income communities like mine. If we want to empower them with the bilingualism, which is a science and a delicate art to teach. I have refugees in my class. I have students who have difficulty self-regulating their emotions. I have students who can't read. I have students reading at third grade level. I have students who struggle with attention. I have students who have gone through traumas. I refuse to leave these 
these kids behind, but I cannot uplift these kids alone. It is a community effort. And when they come to school, they are mandated to take standardized tests, not in their language and instruction that were created for the dominant culture. So when my kids see their scores, I see the disappointment in their eyes, and I have to be there to pick up their pe the pieces and tell them that they are not, they are not they are not their score. When we bring up school building issues of cleanliness and security to our district, and it's not treated with the ur urgency that sends a message to our kids and to our teachers that we are not valued. There are some days I cannot hear my students because of the loud air vents in our schools. These air vents were put in the 60s. These are teachers in my building who get sick due to the lack of cleanliness or of air vents. So why do I stay? I come for the kids who were me, my sister, my brothers, needing academic support that is culturally relevant and responsive, needing their uh, identities to be uplifted and their learning pr preferences taken into account. These issues have taken a physical and mental toll on me and our teachers need help. So what can we do about it? Well, there's a number of things there, and first and foremost is, uh, I don't know where you are, but I hope you'll come so, you know, see me afterwards, uh, is to say thank you. Thank you to, for being a dedicated teacher, uh, for giving so much of yourself, and that's why I say I, you know, in my, I was a corporate lawyer for 22 years, but, but uh, I truly valued the time I got to spend with educators because uh, I had never met a one anywhere across this state there for whom it was just a job. It was a vocation. Uh, and they do it and they sacrifice uh, and they don't always get the thanks and acknowledgement they deserve or frankly the compensation uh, for a di very difficult job and, and it's true. Every societal problem, every societal problem walks into our classrooms every day. Mm -hmm. And then we ask teachers to deal with that. Oh, and by the way, teach on top of that. Uh, and then we don't always provide the systems of support you need uh, to do your job effectively uh, and give you the time to prepare and, uh, and lesson plan and to assess uh, and, and truly have some time in your day, uh, just not going from class to class to class, to think about those students and their need, individual needs. You know, that's what we need to do. We're obviously not there. The uh, equity-based funding formula is a huge step. Uh, it was a historic step to get to that point. Uh, we do have 852 independently elected school boards, and that's one plug for this, this room. I will give run for school board. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got one that's still appointed, and th you know, we've got Miguel Del Valle now heading the Chicago Public Schools. It makes a difference. You know, when briefly we had a CEO of Chicago Public Schools who was Latino, he thought maybe I should check on bilingual students in this district that was never done before. Uh, and so it makes a difference when you're at the table and you can impact some of these policies, uh, hopefully for all students, but particularly for students of color uh, in our low income and high need students who you know, we know with the right investments and support will do as well or better as any other student. We just need to give them those systems of support uh, and supporting our teachers as well. So um, for those question earlier about young people and like run for school board. I mean, we've had school board members in their teens in the state. Bob Menendez, Senator of New Jersey, first elected office, school board. So um, I commend you all, run for your local school boards, get involved uh, and, and, and help advocate for some of the changes we need. And again, whoever wrote the question and look, look forward to talking to you afterwards. Let me add, thanks to what Jesse is saying as well, but also, you know, I think all of us on the stage could talk about feeling overwhelmed sometimes with the problems that we get confronted with and we're not teachers who really are on the front lines. Um, but I do think one thing that I use to cope is we take the problems as they come and we look at different strategies than what has been employed in the past. And I'll take mental health as one particular area of concern for the administration. Something that Sol and I were just discussing the other day is how do we employ and deploy more mental health professionals to deal with 
traditional calls that come into the police or to 911 so that we're de-escalating situations, so that we're helping families who are dealing with a family member who maybe they can't cope with what's happening with them, but they're not, this isn't a criminal situation. This is somewhere where we just, we, we need to help someone deal with an attack or, you know, a moment with, of something they can't deal with. And I think when you talk about schools and there were a number of things in that, um, what the leader just read that I think we think about a lot. Um, school construction, for example, you're right, these schools haven't been updated or looked at in decades. Um, when we fought over the Capitol bill last year, one of the things that the governor's office really put our foot down about was that that bill had to include vertical construction, meaning schools and universities, um, and not just horizontal roads and bridges, um, that we had to be willing to go and use, you know, the funds that we were raising in order to help improve um, the classrooms that our students go into every day. I cannot claim that those things are gonna get fixed overnight, but I do genuinely think that we spend every day thinking about how can we improve some piece of the experience of residents of the state from the youngest and most vulnerable to those folks who are on you know, the tail ends of their lives and how, how can we make their lives easier um, as a state. So oh, thank you for that. Um, I thought that was a good way of ending the questions. Um, something very, just very intense, I would say, and I appreciate the, um, the, um, the response. Well, that concludes uh, this session, this panel. Let's give a round of applause to our deputy governors. I really want to go out of my way to really thank you for taking the time. What better, I mean, the fact that this audience had the opportunity to have really a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with you, and it's coming right from the individuals who are really looking um, over these uh, various departments. And I really appreciate you really taking the time. It's, uh, we really take your uh, participation this, uh, to this event uh, wholeheartedly. Um, it's, it's, a special, um, it's, it's a special occasion to have you here. Thank you. So thanks again. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.